I'm Al O'Quinn, the senior pastor here at Bethany Baptist Church. I want to thank you for joining us on our television broadcast today. It's not by chance or accident that you've joined us today. I pray that as you tune in, you will recognize and realize God had you join us today because he has a message just for you. And so I hope that you'll listen intently and you'll be obedient to the prompting of the Holy Spirit as the Lord speaks to your heart today. I want you to know that we want to pray for you and pray for your needs. And so you can call us at 770-957-4455 and leave your prayer request. Answer machine will come on and you'll leave your request. If no one can answer the phone, please leave it on the voicemail. And we will pray for you. We'll return your call if you leave us a number. And be assured that we'll pray, praying for you and all of your needs. So thank you for joining in the broadcast today from Bethany Baptist Church. I hope you'll come and see us real soon. God bless you, and we'll go to the service right now. Thank you so much. Let me know how much you appreciate that, would you? God bless you. We are glad that we're blessed with folks that uh, have the ability to play and sing and lead and lead us in worship. Thank you so much for being here in the house of the Lord today. Well, I know you missed your hour. Please don't catch it on my time, please. <laughs> All right. I, I want to mention something to you. Notice on the front of the bulletin, um, our, our student uh, search team has been working. And on the front of the bulletin, you'll see a word about Adam. And Adam and Audrey will be here next weekend. Next weekend is the uh, yard sale for our student ministry. And Adam and Audrey will be here uh, coming to meet with our search team, coming to see our church. And Adam will be sharing his testimony next Sunday morning in this service. And he'll be sharing in the early service. But he is the young man that uh, we believe the Lord has uh, led the team to, uh, to be our student pastor. And so we want you to be praying for that team and praying for him next weekend. He was born in Canada, and uh, at the moment he's up in the New England area, lives around uh, close to Boston, and uh, he'd like to get where it's warm too, I think. But uh, uh, he will be with us uh, next weekend, and we're excited about him coming and sharing with us. And so you pray for them, you pray for our, our, our worship pastor search team as they're meeting, the Lord would lead them. But please remember Adam uh, and Audrey in prayer and our, our student search team as they're in process, and they'll be here next weekend. So please remember that. Tonight after uh, worship, we have a call conference. Personnel team will make a presentation about uh, interim worship pastor uh, Paul. And uh, so there'll be a vote after the evening worship service tonight for the interim position. And so please keep that covered in your prayers. And you know, there's so many things in the bulletin. We can't mention all those to you this morning. There's a lot there. There's a lot of good things there. And so we, we just want you to read the bulletin and be aware of what's happening. Take it home, put it on the refrigerator like we do, and you keep up with what's going on. We want to look this morning in Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. And uh, we have, we're bringing this to a close about the one another's. There, there are about 59, uh, 48, if you got, start looking specifically, about 48, there are about uh, one another directives in the New Testament. And we won't do all those. We've done a few of those. And this morning, we want to conclude with forgive one another. Now we've talked about praying for one another and we've talked about serving one another and uh, we've talked about encouraging one another. So I want to ask you did, you, did you try to encourage somebody last week? I hope you did. I know that I was encouraged. I got emails and notes and cards and phone calls and, and I, hope, I hope that you encouraged somebody uh, last week and that you uh, tried to give them a word of encouragement to help them to press on in life's journey because we need to encourage one another, particularly in these perilous times in which we live. People need to be encouraged. And so please do that. Well, today we want to talk about probably one of the more difficult directives that the Lord has given us, and that is forgive one another. Now, you'll notice in Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, Colossians three thirteen. It says, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Wow, what a powerful passage and a very direct word. Then in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14, the Sermon on the Mount, on the Mount Jesus is speaking in the 14th verse of the 6th chapter. For he says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Let's pray. Father, in these moments, 
May we be good stewards of our time. We know, Lord, that uh, we missed an hour last night. I pray that you'd keep us alert and attentive and that you would uh, help us to hear from you today. No one's interested in hearing what I have to say. Lord, we want to know what you have to say. And so we want to hear from you today very clearly, very specifically, and very precisely. And so, Lord, I pray that you would shield me behind the cross and the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. And I pray this in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. This directive, forgive one another, is most, is, is, of all the subjects we've talked about, is probably the most difficult and is the most sensitive subject that we could talk about, perhaps. Because every one of us in this room, at some place, point in time, we have been deeply wounded or hurt by someone. All of us have experienced some kind of hurt at the hand of another. And it's not fun being hurt. It's not fun dealing with the pain that comes through a broken trust or through a violation or, or through things that happen that are unnecessary. Every one of us has been hurt deeply. It might have been a parent. It might have been a spouse. It might have been a preacher. It might have been a Sunday school teacher or a deacon. It might have been a relative, a child, a friend, a stranger. Or it could have been a church experience. Now here's what we know. We know that the church is not perfect. We are all very imperfect people. And sitting in this room today are people that have been saved by the grace of God, joint heirs with Christ Jesus, and yet in all of our life experience we have a degree of dysfunction. And we have past and we have things that we're dealing with. And I will tell you, and many of you know this, you've experienced this, I hope you haven't. I hope you never will. But one of the deepest hurts you could ever experience could come at church. And when you get hurt at church, it's unlike anything else. Do you know that on a regular basis there are hundreds and hundreds of ministers, pastors, worship pastors, children's pastors, hundreds of pastors that that every week are terminated from the places of service, not because of moral issues, not because of anything of a moral issue, but oftentimes because of, of preferences in the life of the church or personality conflicts and those kind of things. And, uh, you know, many, many of those people that got hurt that way never go back into the ministry. I was talking with a friend recently that had been in that particular situation. He'd served in the pastorate. He'd, he got... Uh, Terminated, relieved of his responsibilities, he left. He started serving the Lord in another capacity, uh, working in other areas of ministry. And finally the Lord uh, brought healing in their life and the wife was get, being healed. And so they went back and they'd been back in the work for about six months and it happened again. I doubt very seriously if he'll ever go back in the ministry. What a tragedy. But it happens. The deepest hurts. And you know, we have to be forgiving and sometimes it's hard to forgive. And the directive to forgive one another is the most difficult because sometimes, you know what? We don't want to forgive. We don't want to forgive. We want to be angry. We want to be mad. We want justice. We want to get even. We want to settle the score. Because we've been hurt. And I, I, you know, we talk about forgiveness. And the line that I hear oftentimes in talking with people about forgiveness is, well, you just don't know what they did to me. Now, we'll talk about that in a moment. But we want to strike back. And we're all still learning how to forgive and how to be forgiving. And the Bible's very clear about forgiving one another. It's very direct. Forgive one another as you have been forgiven in Christ Jesus by Christ Jesus. And there's a great uh, parable and a great uh, truth in Matthew 18, beginning with verse 21, I guess. Simon Peter came to Jesus and he said, Lord, how often should I forgive my brother? Three times? 
I mean, seven times, and, the, and he said seven times because the rabbi said three. So he said, how often should I forgive my brother? Seven times? Now, here's what Peter was thinking. The rabbi said three times. So if I add three more and one for good measure, seven sounds like a good number. So the rabbis have said, you only forgive somebody three times. Peter is saying seven times. And the Lord says, Simon Peter, listen to me. You are to forgive your brother. You are to forgive that person 70 times seven. So you multiply it, what's that, 490 times? So you're going to count? And so when they get to 491, well, that's it. You've passed the limit. No, that's not what he's talking about. Seven is a number of completeness. Seven is a number of perfection. Seventy times seven means an infinite number of times. He says you are to forgive your brother, your neighbor, your sister. You're to forgive one another an infinite number of times as you have been forgiven by Christ Jesus. You are to be forgiven. Forgiven. And why do we forgive? Why is it important that we forgive? Because we are the children of God. Christ Jesus is in us. And when we forgive, I want you to listen to this. When we forgive, forgiveness reflects the very character of God. Forgiveness reflects the character of God. When we forgive, we are most like God. When we forgive, we are most like God who has forgiven us a debt which we could never, ever pay. Now, in that story, in the parable of uh, in the Matthew's gospel, when Peter asked, how often should I forgive my brother? Seven times, the Lord said, 70 times seven. He told the parable of the unmerciful servant. A man was brought before the master who had an un unpayable debt, and he pled for mercy. He could never pay the debt. Ever, ever could he pay the debt. He should go to debtor's prison. He should be tortured. He should be tormented. And yet the master forgives him of a debt that could never be paid. But what does he do? He leaves that setting, and he goes out in the community, and he finds a guy that owes him a payable debt. And the guy that owes the payable debt begins to plead for mercy. But the guy refuses to forgive and extend mercy, yet he has been forgiven of a debt that can never be paid. Well, when the master heard of such, he said, go get that guy that I forgave. I forgave him of a debt he could never pay. And they brought him before the master, and he said, I forgave you of a debt that you could never pay, but you refused to extend grace and mercy of a debt that could be paid. And the Bible says he was delivered over into the hands of the tormentors. Now, let me tell you, people who will not forgive are delivered over into the hands of the tormentors. Nothing will torment your soul and spirit more than being bitter and resentful and hostile and, and hurting deep within your inner being because you refuse to forgive. Forgiveness reflects the character of God. When we forgive as God has forgiven us, oh, what a sweet thing that is. When we forgive, we show that the Spirit of God is in us. So forgiveness reflects the very character of God. We look so much like God when we forgive. Secondly, forgiveness releases us. When we forgive one another, it releases us. The alternative, listen now, the alternative to forgiveness is resentment, bitterness, and hostility. The alternative to forgiveness is bitterness, resentment, and hostility. And there is a high cost and a high price for getting even or wanting to get even. People who refuse to forgive hurt themselves. They become bitter people. And no one wants to be around bitter people. People who are bitter, people who are mad, people who are critical, people who are hostile, and they don't even realize because they refuse to forgive, it is beginning to affect them emotionally, spiritually, and physically. It affects their health. It affects their relationship with God. It affects the relationship with their spouse, with their children, with those they work with. It's very obvious. You can see it. They're negative. They're critical. They're antagonistic. And their lives have been polluted by the feelings of resentment and hostility. Because the Bible talks about those people who refuse to forgive, taking root in the inner being of their soul and their spirit is the seed of bitterness. Bitterness. And it begins to grow. 
and it begins to grow and it begins to grow. And everything you see, your, everything you look at, everything is colored. Everything you look at, everything is colored by the seed of bitterness within your inner being. Have you ever seen somebody at work and somebody say, why are they always mad? Why are they always angry? Why are they always critical? Why are they always so difficult to be around? More than likely, they've been hurt. More than likely, they've been deeply wounded and they have refused to forgive and turn loose. You see, it's, it's wrong. It's harmful to you. And you may think that by bitterness and resentment and withholding forgiveness that you're getting even with that person. No, you're not. Because a person that's in prison is you and me when we refuse to forgive. They're controlling us. Um, have you ever sat on your leg... You know, sometimes you sit in your style, you sit on a leg or you pull your leg up and you sit on your leg. And if you sit on your leg long enough, when you get up, you can't stand up. You, you stop the blood flow in your leg and there's no circulation and your leg has actually become numb. Do you know people that, that refuse to forgive and, and uh, release the grace of God and mercy of God, it's, it's like that leg that goes numb. The flow of the Spirit of God is no longer operating there, and there's a numbness because they have been, they have rendered in a, they've been rendered to a state of per, uh, being in paralysis, and, and they, they've become very indifferent, and so their hearts are not in tune with God, and they're not walking with God, and they're really numb to life and numb to the things of God because bitterness has done that, because they've refuse to forgive and you see we suffer spiritually when we do not forgive we suffer physically when we do not forgive an unforgiving heart binds the holy spirit's ability to work in our lives and it disrupts meaningful fellowship with the lord and it robs us of our joy and you know that may be that that, that, that there are people this way and you know their circumstances well i, I just not get anything out of worship i just not get anything out preaching I'm just I just don't know why I bother to go to church and oftentimes in situations like that it's a root it's a it's a seed of bitterness in your heart that has blocked and cut off the flow of the work of the spirit in your heart and life because you're not sensitive to the things of God because you're angry and you're bitter and you're hostile and you're indifferent we have to forgive and so forgiveness forgiveness is not uh, is not an option for the believer did you know that for, forgiveness is an obligation, it's a command of the Lord that we must forgive as he has forgiven us. And forgiveness yields power in the life of the one that's been forgiven. Forgiveness yields power to the life of the one that's been forgiven. Think about the grace of God in your own life. Think about the grace of God. I was lost in sin, damned and doomed, dead in my trespasses, alienated from the commonwealth of God. And all of us have a different story. And all of us have walked a different journey. And yet God, who is rich in mercy, has not dealt with us according to our sins, but according to his grace, and he has forgiven us. And we've been set free. We've been released God's grace liberates us and our extension of grace and forgiveness to the one that has wronged us liberates them as it liberates us. So we must be the extension of God's grace and forgiveness because God demands it. But you know, there's some principles about forgiveness and is this an act of grace, an act of grace is wonderful. It comes from God. But we're only able to give as we are empowered by the grace of God. Forgiveness is an act of grace of the power of God in your life. Forgiveness is an act of grace of the power of God in your life. Forgiveness is not easy. It's not easy. And when we forgive, it is the grace of God. You may be struggling today because even talking about the th fact of forgiveness has opened a wound a hurt that you thought about and you're still dealing with it and to to really forgive to forgive someone requires the work of God in your life because it's not a natural thing it's not a natural act to forgive it is a supernatural act to forgive it is a super, supernatural empowerment to forgive 
It's being connected with the, with the living Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit and walking daily with him and knowing his heart and mind that enables us to be the extension of grace and forgiveness. It's a supernatural act. How can you explain parents forgiving someone that murdered a child? It's the grace of God. It's a supernatural thing. How can you explain a spouse forgiving a spouse that's been unfaithful, committed adultery, infidelity? How, how can they do that? It's the supernatural act. It's the grace of God. And when you've been deeply wounded and hurt, it requires the measure of the grace of God. It requires the spirit of God. It requires you being still before the Lord and asking for strength. Because that's the only way it happens. That's the only way we can explain the grace of God, uh, forgiveness is the overwhelming presence of the Spirit of God and the grace of God. And here's the thing. God demands that we do it. It's not an option. God demands that we do it. It's not an option. We have to forgive as we have been forgiven in Christ Jesus and we need help. And you would acknowledge that, that there are people that are hard to love and there are people that are hard to being around and, and uh, people just, you know, their personality conflicts and those kind of things. And we get hurt and we get wounded and it hurts really bad and uh, we just say, well, I'm not going to forgive. I, I'm just not going to forgive. And I would remind us all today because I've had this said to me, well, preacher, you just don't know what they did to me. Well, let's just be really transparent today. Let's be honest and look at it in our own hearts and minds. The Bible says we should forgive as we have been forgiven by Christ Jesus. Nobody in this room has ever been mistreated and hurt more deeply than God the Father. And nobody's ever been mistreated more hurt than God the Son, Jesus Christ, who came and was stretched out on Calvary's cross to die for our sins. They lied about him. They lied about him. They trapped him. They worked against him from the day his ministry started. And they killed him. And he was without fault. And he knew no sin. And yet he came to do the purpose of the Father, and yet he was wronged. And even as he hung on Calvary's cross, and they watched him die, and you've heard me say this, they never saw anybody die like Jesus because they heard him say, Father, forgive them. Now, I don't know how bad you've been hurt. God does. But no matter how bad you've hurt, been hurt, and no bad, matter how deeply you have been hurt, you've not been hurt as bad, as deeply as Jesus Christ. Do you know why we have trouble forgiving? Because we think more highly of ourselves than we ought. The reason we have trouble forgiving is pride, P-R-I-D-E. I didn't deserve that. Why did they do that? I deserve better. Why did they do that? Well, it happened. Did Jesus deserve to die? Did Jesus deserve? Well, it was the purpose of the Father. It was a sovereign will of the Father. But listen, the Father said, forgive. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This extension of grace and mercy. God forgives. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And so forgiveness is an act of grace empowered by God. Secondly, true forgiveness results in a changed attitude toward that other person. True forgiveness results in a changed attitude toward that other person. Now, what does it mean to forgive? To forgive means you no longer want to punch him in the nose. To forgive means you no longer want to get even. To forgive means you no longer are seeking the harm of the offender, but you begin to seek the good of the one that wronged you. That's what God did in Christ Jesus. We wronged him. And he sought to bless us. And he sought to help us. And he sought to make it better for us and seek the good for us. That's the way forgiveness works. 
It is an effect to, to restore a relationship, to restore a relationship. And that's, that's what has to happen. Forgiveness, then, is not working to harm someone, but it's working to help someone, and we forgive them. We release, we forgive, we turn it loose, and we extend grace. You see, when we love and we forgive, that's so important. Because what happens in forgiveness is love, love, love happens, and the hate and the hurt has been replaced by love. And the third thing is that true forgiveness takes time. It take, we have to forgive, but the recovery, the recovery takes time. The roots of bitterness go deep, and the deeper the hurt, the more time we need. The more difficult the situation, the more time we need. But as we trust in the Lord, as we extend forgiveness, healing comes to the heart, healing comes to the soul, because forgiveness is a decision of the mind, but also it is a response of the heart. As we grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord, we extend forgiveness. Somebody says, well, I can be forgive, but I can't forget. Well, I, I, you know, I, I've read a lot about forgiveness and forgetting and those kind of things. You will remember. You can't help but remember. You're human. But you no longer choose to camp out there and think about it and, and, and brood over it and live there. It no longer dominates your life. It no longer controls your life. It no longer controls your mind. It no longer controls your thinking. You've turned it loose. You see, when trust has been violated in a marital or relationship, when a spouse has committed uh, uh, adultery or they've been unfaithful, there can be forgiveness. But it takes a long time for trust to be restored. It takes a long, long time. And so it takes time to work through these things. And forgiveness, it takes time, it takes time, it takes time. But we have to forgive and we have to turn loose. And I'll tell you what has to happen. When you forgive and you release it, it means you're not always reaching back here to get it and bring it back up here. Particularly to an emeritus relationship, even in the daily spats and the things that go on in life, we have to forgive and move on. If any time you get in a, a, a disagreement with your spouse and you're always reaching back here in the past to pull some out to hit them over the head with, you really hadn't turned it loose. I mean, if you're still talking about things that happened 10 years ago, 5 years ago, you haven't turned it loose. So we have to forgive. It's an act of love and grace, and forgiveness must be realistic. The act of forgiveness will not necessarily make things as they were before the offense happened. Now, I want you to get that. We have to be realistic. When there's been hurt and when you've been wounded and when you've mis been mistreated, it doesn't mean that every, when you forgive that everything's going to go back the way it was. It doesn't. It doesn't happen that way. It never goes back like it was. You know, the Bible says that, that when someone falls, and they fall into sin, the body of Christ, we're to do that. We're to help them. We're to lift them up. We're to lift their burden. We're to walk through them and pick them up and help them find forgiveness and grace and mercy. And we are to restore them to usefulness. And I tell you, we can restore them to usefulness, but they'll never be again at the place they were before they fail. And I'm not uh, picking on preachers, but you can drive down in... Uh, Louisiana, I forget the road it's on, but you can see standing out there on the road a monument that started up, a building that started up, and it's not complete. It was a church that Jimmy Swaggart was building. And I used to like to hear Jimmy Swaggart sing, play the piano. But there was moral failure in his life, and they started building a building you know, and there was moral failure. And he was forgiven and he's been restored to usefulness, but never again to the place that he was. That's a tragedy. And there sitting on the road there is a reminder of what sin does. We can always be forgiven, but there are always the consequences of sin. And so things don't always go back the way they were. But relationships can be restored and we must extend grace and forgiveness to one another. 
I'm going to tell you this. I know I've shared this at night. I think I may have during the day. I don't remember. But it's very relevant to me in this setting and this situation. The Lord has taught us many things on the journey with Matt's health issues that started back in December the 8th, 2010, up to December the 17th of this year, this past year when he got his liver. By the way, he named his liver Oliver, so um, uh, I don't know why. But early on in the journey, in the first two weeks of the journey, there was some deep-seated hurt that came my way in the way his case was handled. We felt like that the people had not been honest with us and truthful with us. We found that their stories didn't match. It almost looked like somebody wasn't telling the truth. And we were hurt and we were deeply wounded. We'd almost come, we had come to the conclusion that once we get out of here, we're not coming back. And we went to MD Anderson. And when we came back, we, we went to Piedmont. And we were talking about what we were going to do. You know, the prognosis was he had less than a year to live. And we, were, we, we felt deeply wounded by what had transpired in the beginning. We said, we're not going to use that doctor, and we can't go there. We can't go to their hospital. We can't use that doctor. And then we would sit around talking one day, and um, Matt said, Dad, what's the Bible say? The Bible says we have to forgive and I want you folks to know, and he's talking to the family, I forgive him. I forgive them. We have to do that. And I will tell you today that had we not taken the step to forgive, Matt might not be alive today. Because that doctor saved his life. That doctor saved his life. And they developed the friendship that's so fantastic. That's the power of forgiveness. What are you missing out on? Because you're holding on to hurts and you don't want to forgive. What are you missing out on? What is available to you if only you would forgive? And the Bible says we must because God has forgiven us in Christ Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, that we would know your heart and your mind and that we would walk in your way. And to walk in your way is to know that we must be the extension of grace and forgiveness. Lord, it's not easy to forgive when we've been wrong, we've been hurt, we've been offended, we've been taken advantage of, we've been used, we've been lied about, we, we've been talked about. But we're not above our master. And so, Lord, help us to humble ourselves and die to ourselves daily that pride would not hinder us from doing that which we ought to do, forgive. And it may be today, Lord, that somebody needs to forgive a husband or a wife or a child or a parent or a co-worker. Lord, you know our hearts. I pray the power of the Holy Spirit would speak to us today. Now, it doesn't mean that everything's going to go back like it was. It, it, it may never go back like it was. Probably won't in some cases. But there's freedom in forgiveness. And there's freedom in turning loose and being the extension of your grace. And so today, Lord, help us to do that. I pray, Father, if there's someone here today that needs you as Lord and Savior, they, they just step out today to, to seek you, to seek your mind, and to trust you. And Lord, whatever you'd prompt us to do in this hour decision, that we'd be obedient to the prompting of your spirit. We pray this in the name above all names, the name of Jesus. Amen. As we stand.
Well, I hope you enjoyed the uh, message today and the time of worship. And I pray that you sense the Lord's presence right there where you are in your own home or in a hotel room or wherever you're watching the service today. We hope that uh, you sense the presence of the Lord. And hope you'll be faithful to tune in every Sunday on this channel at this time to watch the broadcast. I want you to know that Bethany Baptist Church is located at the corner of Highway 81 and uh, Bethany Road. And we encourage you to come and uh, visit with us. If you have prayer concerns, please call us at uh, our church number, 770-957-4455. Or you can email us at uh, www.4nbethany.org. And we'll be glad to hear from you, take your prayer requests, and I assure you that we will pray over your needs. So thank you for joining us and look forward to you being with us again next Sunday.